Okay then, so this lesson is uh, the first one I've done this way. Uh, it's basically for those students who missed either my lesson on Monday morning, uh, which Danny did, or if you knew the class, he missed it on Wednesday morning, which I kind of took over from Danny. Um, so it's just going to quickly go over what we did basically. I'll then do another video after this one where I'll kind of do lesson three and four of the week. So for the Monday class, that's Tuesday, which some of you are in, and then Thursday, which we all missed obviously. And then for the class I should be having Friday morning, it'd be the what you would have done on Friday morning basically. So for those who are just that, you need to print out the Alexander II booklet, or you can download it, can't you, off the Moodle, and then obviously you can tippy tappy your answers onto it. Uh, make sure you keep saving it and stuff so you don't lose it. Um, basically, um, what we did, well, what Danny Stroke me did, depending who you had, is that. Well, first of all, we went over the course. So basically, this Russia course covers Alexander through to Khrushchev. Um, all the exams two and a half hours long. Uh, for the exam, two of you'll have two essays to write out of a choice of three, and they're kind of big essays, and they cover the entire period. So you'll get questions like, you know, um, how far did the revolution of 1917 change Russian governments in the period 1855 to 1964? Um, so you've got to kind of have bits of Tsar stuff in, a bit of uh, Soviet stuff in, and kind of compare them and stuff. Um, and then there's three areas which are um, interpretations uh, where you basically have two historians' views of about half a page each, perhaps a bit less. And you've got to kind of uh, do some work on those interpretations. And the three areas where there's interpretation questions is Alexander, Khrushchev and um, the provisional government. Um, you'll have, you'll, there'll only be one of those questions, there's no choice. So one year it might be Khrushchev and the next year it might be Alexander II, etc, etc. Um, so obviously what we're going to do today is start off on Alexander II stuff. And again, some of the information which we'll do in Alexander II will also fit into those long-range questions. In fact, you must use some Alexander stuff for those long-range questions. It's good to have some information from the start and the end of his period. So, what those people missed on Monday stroke Wednesday morning was basically what Danny did to begin with. There was a card sorting activity, and essentially it's a whole list of events in Alexander's reign. Some of them show Alexander to be... Um, progressive making you know, trying to modernize Russia and um, things like emancipating the serfs that type of stuff some of the events kind of showed Alexander to be much more repressive and kind of trying to keep control of people turning back kind of the reforms that he'd made uh, that kind of stuff and then there were a couple of events on there which are kind of neutral things like you know he became the czar that type of stuff what I'll do I think Danny's sent me a link with it on so if she has I'm pretty sure so earlier on I'll send it out to you we didn't write them down or anything we just kind of discussed them because it kind of shows lots of reforms at the beginning then there's an assassination attempt and then he kind of goes oh no I can't do any more reforms and he kind of tries to bring it all back in again um etc etc so that's basically the first lesson uh the first hour i know it didn't sound much for an hour uh, but it did take a bit to sort them all out and have a chat about some of the key events and things on there if when you look through them you don't know what one or two of the things might mean um then just send me an email or something and if i know the answer myself i'll get back to you okay in the second lesson we then really looked at um why did alexander emancipate the serfs emancipating the serfs basically means freeing them uh, the serfs, they're not quite like slaves, but they're not far off, if that makes sense. So it's a bit like in like medieval England type of thing, where the peasants basically had to kind of stay on their land of their lords. They had to um, grow a certain amount of food and spend a certain amount of time for free, you know, tending his land and all that kind of stuff. And in kind of, in response, not response, in kind of return... Um, they were kind of, you know, given some little bit of land for themselves to farm so they could kind of grow enough for themselves, um, that type of stuff. Um, there were quite a lot of controls on the search as well by the landowners. Things like marriage, for example, they had to get permission if they wanted to get married and who to. If they wanted to leave their land owners' kind of territories, um, again, they needed to get permission. Um, so there lots and lots of control of the search. And so what we did in the first lesson, I can't find whether Danny sent me this or not, but basically we had a couple of pictures which showed some serfs. Um, I'll try and dig some out and I'll send them to you um, on, a power, on a PowerPoint so you can see what they are. But basically what the, the basic gist is, um, 
they kind of lived very communally. So like he had whole families living in like one kind of wooden hut type of thing. It's quite a large wooden hut, but it's a wooden hut. Um, it, there's a picture of someone sowing seeds on the land using a bucket and his hand, kind of scratching them around like they would have done kind of in medieval times. And we kind of had a chat to say, well, technology had moved on. You know, if, if there were photos of Victorian farmers in England, you know, they don't quite have combine harvesters, but it's... They were experimenting with steam powered stuff for doing things like that. Uh, they did have more machinery, um, and of course that leads to issues uh, regarding food, doesn't it? Because if you know, if you don't have the machinery and you don't have things like um, the chemicals to put on the land for fertilizer and stuff, it means you can't grow as much, and it also means you're susceptible, aren't you, to um, food shortages and um, if you have like a bad harvest and stuff like that. So we had a chat about that. And then basically what we did, there's a PowerPoint which I'll send to you. Um, I think it might even be on Moodle, but I'll, I'll send it to you and then you've got it. Uh, and it basically talks about how the Crimean War um, partly led to the emancipation of the Serfs. Because basically in the 1860s, Alexander says, OK, then we need to change this, let's emancipate the Serfs. And he kind of frees them. Uh, but there are a number of reasons why he does this. And the PowerPoint kind of goes through the Crimean War. Now, you don't need to know all the ins and outs and all the different kind of gory details um some of them are on that powerpoint it's basically it was a war over the crimea the crimea is in the southern bit of what is well it's controversial it used to be part of the ukraine up until vladimir putin took it back it's basically got the only warm water port for russia what that means is all the other ports for russia for their military ships and things are going in and out of and i suppose domestic ships as well are all kind of north of the arctic circle or very close to it so obviously in the winter months they all get frozen up and you can't move your boats about uh, this particular port in the south of russia is the only one that's on the black sea uh, and there's a map as well on the powerpoint which shows you roughly where it is it's kind of the black sea is kind of on the edge of like romania and bulgaria uh, and turkey to the south so it's nice and warm so they can use their big military boats all year round it's the reason why putin has just got it back basically um, to cut a long story short, there was some kind of conflict um, regarding Britain and France, something to do with the Orthodox Church, you don't need to know the ins and outs, but basically Britain and France basically um, attack Russia and they basically take Sevastopol, which is the main port in the Crimea, and take all that bit of land. The Tsar at the time, Nicholas I, kind of, he's a bit of a military guy, uh, he's a bit upset by this, um, he then dies. Um, if ever you watched Lucy Worsley's series, she kind of suggests that he kind of killed himself by giving himself a bad cold. Well, I don't know how true that is, but anyway, he dies. And there's a lovely quote in that PowerPoint where he says to his son, Essentially, I've left you a right mess. Uh, you, your job is now to sort it out. Good luck, essentially, is what he basically says. Uh, but he also says you must maintain autocracy as well. Um, so Alexander II inherits this situation. He signs a humiliating peace treaty, the Treaty of, the, the the treaty of Paris, uh, which is not very favourable to Russia. Um, but the lesson he really learns from this is that basically, whilst we have served them, we ain't going to win any battles because most of the Russian army was made up of these serfs. Many of them couldn't read and write. Many of them were not in the best physical kind of condition. Many of them kind of we conscripted to the army more out of, you know, they had to, more than kind of they wanted to. Um, and so basically the conclusion he came to, and one or two others as well, was actually it's an issue of national security. We need to um, do something about the CERS uh, in order to do some military reforms as well. Technologically as well, the Crimea shows just how far behind Russia was. Um, I'm not a military expert, but, you know, the guns which Russia had or the cannons they had were not kind of of the same caliber as those which britain and france had hence why they were beaten uh, transportation was shown to be a big issue they couldn't get food down to where the armies were in the crimea they couldn't get guns and weapons down there either because they didn't really have any railways um so it really highlights the crimean war just how kind of backwards and um yeah backwards really russia was so what you need to do is if you look on Moodle, uh, under Alexander II, and look under the resource Alexander II, there's a document called Evans and Jenkins Chapter 2. This is the Evans and Jenkins book. It's a really good book. Uh, if I was going to buy any book on Russia, by the way, um, there is an access to history book we use, but 
I don't really rate it that much. This is a really good book. I got it quite cheap off Amazon. It's Evans and Jenkins, Years of Russia, and I'm trying to read it the wrong way around, Russia and the USSR, 1851 to 1991. Anyway, if you look on Moodle, most of it is on Moodle, so you don't need to buy it. If you do look on Moodle, and if you look at chapter 2, which is on there, uh, it has a page or two, and it's on page 28. It says, A Force for Change. Uh, it starts off, Alexander had no sympathy for radical liberal ideas, blah, 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 blah. And then it has... Um, in smallish writing, for a couple of pages, it has force for change, personnel, political, legacy of the Crimean War, moral, economic, and then general. Uh, what we're going to do is, in your booklet, um, a page or two in, there's a diagram that says, why did Alexander II decide to emancipate the Serfs? And it has reasons for emancipation, losing the Crimean War, which I spelt wrong, Okay, what I want you to do is to read those bits of the Evans and Jenkins book and then fill in that um, diagram. So what I'll do, um, you can pause this now so you can do that and then you can press play again and I'll go over what the main points were. So press pause, do that stuff and then press play again and then I'll bore you a bit more about what kind of the conclusions were from the book. Okay then, so from having done that task, uh, you can see there's a number of reasons laid out. Uh, you've got the Crimean War, which I mentioned before, and the fact that this desire that they need to emancipate the Serfs because it shows how backwards uh, Russia was. And again, when you looked at that PowerPoint as well, uh, there's quite an, there's a little quote or two, isn't there, uh, about this. There are some other reasons as well, and if you, from that stuff that which we read, so for example, there's this moral argument. Uh, this had been around since Nicholas the first time, so Alexander's daddy, uh, in 1842, he, he, he said to the council of state, there can be no doubt that serfdom in its present situation in our country is an evil. It cannot last forever. The only answer to this is to prepare the way for a gradual transition to a different order. So even his dad, um, 20 odd years earlier, had recognised there was a moral kind of argument to say, you know, slavery isn't very good essentially, which, you know, I think most would probably agree with, agree with. And then it also mentioned some other people. So there's a very, there's a couple of landowners who kind of agreed. Most of the landowners didn't agree with that because they obviously made money out of having serfs because if they didn't have serfs, they'd have to pay someone to do the land and all the rest of it. So in that respect, there was a large group of people who were not in favour of emancipating the serfs because they made quite a lot of money out of having free labour, essentially. So there's the moral argument. We've got the crime here, which I mentioned before, which we hope we should be okay with. In terms of personnel, or personal reasons, um, Alexander himself, it kind of says, was aware uh, about the fundamental weakness of this. He was also aware that there were some landowners and family relations who were quite keen for big change. So, for example, his brother, Grand Duke Constantine, uh, he was very keen on uh, having reform, and I can't remember if it's his mother or his auntie, I think it's his auntie, um, Elena or Helena, um, she uh, was also very keen on having a quite radical change as well. Uh, you've also got the economic reasons as well. So, I said before, one economic reason for keeping it might be the fact that the landowners get free labour, which makes it obviously nice and cheap for them. However, it has also been criticised on economic grounds as well. So, for example, um, it's been criticised on the grounds that it's not very efficient. So the serfs basically don't really want to work on the landowner's land. They're kind of told to, you know, spend five days out of seven doing the land or whatever. But it takes away any drive they might have to innovate or use, te new, or use new technology. Um, you know, why would you want to innovate and think, I've got... I want to try an experiment with these new seeds or whatever, um, where it's not going to benefit you in any way. So it kind of prevents kind of innovation and all that kind of stuff. Um, it also prevents, in many ways, landowners investing as well. So if they've got loads of service, why do they need to spend money on importing or allowing Russians to develop like new, you know, ploughs or mechanization or anything like that? So it kind of maintains this backwardness if you like of the um, agriculture um, 
So, yes, there are those sorts of issues. So there are, there are some real big economic issues. Uh, there's also this, this stuff as well about how the noblemen are in debt as well. Because they've been spending money left, right and centre, trying to keep up with their aristocratic friends in Europe, in Prussia and Britain and France and stuff, they basically got them into such an economic pickle um, that they'd mortgage the serfs. And what that means is, it's like when you buy a house, you know, when I bought my house here, I didn't have like 100 grand to spare. Not my poverty pay anyway. Uh, so obviously you go to the bank and they loan you that money and then you pay it back every month until you're dead or you bought the house completely. Uh, well, basically they'd mortgage their serfs. So the landowners basically gone to the banks and said, well, my land's worth this. I've got 20,000 serfs or whatever it is. Uh, they're all worth this amount of money. Uh, and they kind of borrowed it that way. So a lot of the landowners were actually mortgaged to their serfs, which could be an argument against reform because it's going to create a lot of opposition from these people. You know, they don't want to give up um, on this. So economically, there's some arguments for reform and some arguments against it as well. Um, I think the biggest one for reform from economic point of view is this fact that it's prevented innovation, it's prevented change, Russia's kind of stuck in the past and therefore they're susceptible to things like famines and stuff because it only needs a couple of years bad harvest or whatever and just a certain creek without a paddle if they're not careful. So there are some of the main reasons and then there's also the reasons as well that there were an increase or there was an increase in peasant uprisings as well and disturbances. And again, there's a nice little graph, isn't there, on page 31, which kind of says in 1826, it was 148, and 1845 to 54, 348, and 1861, 1859. So there's, there's been lots of disturbances, especially in the lead up to emancipation. Now, that might be because the peasants were aware that the Tsar was going to try and emancipate them, so they're kind of pushing him to do it by, you know, having some uprisings or something. But even in the previous decades, you can see there's 148, 216, 248, so, again, this is a cost as well, because obviously you need to use the army which the Tsar has and the police and stuff to maintain order and keep them down. And, of course, it's going to cost the landowners money to keep the peasants down as well. So it does kind of indicate that people are unhappy with serfdom from the peasants' point of view. OK, you then says, which reason do you think is the most important and why? So you need to use your family brain cell and decide which one you think is the most important. And then the final thing we did is that we went back to the first page and looked at what was the character like of Alexander II. I suppose we should have done this first, really, but anyway. Uh, and there's basically three views of historians. So you've got Grenville, Cranshaw and Moss. And it says, from these three historians, what do they agree upon about the character? And then you've got to think about, well, why might that be a problem for an autocrat? So an autocrat, you know, he makes all the decisions. He's the sole decision-making person. These three sources, if you read them, kind of say he's a bit lazy and he's a bit indecisive. So think about, well, why might that be a problem? And then the final source, which has been separated, had a different view of Alexander from a historian. And it's just to, we've got to say what his view is, basically. Um, so, yeah, so that is basically lesson one and lesson two. So if you get those things done, and in a couple of minutes, I'll upload the next video, which will be on the equivalent of lesson three and then lesson four.